So it's John Reed. I'm live with a very special guest. How you doing, man? I'm doing very good. How are you? Mr. Monroe, as I always call you, because I think of you by your Twitter handle, which is <laughs> M-R-I-N-A-L. <laughs> we have been trying to get together for a taping for the longest time, uh-huh. and our diverse journeys have brought us here to the SAP Tech Ed Barcelona. Yeah. We're going to talk about Internet of Things, which is something that has sort of disrupted your career. Yeah. <laughs> or you have used that to disrupt your career, one or the other. No, it just <laughs> happened, but it's been fantastic. So we're going to talk about that, and we we probably tape an additional podcast on what you're finding about SAP's IoT strategy. But this one's going to just be about IoT stuff in general. But I did want to ask you a little bit just about your your career path, because you were, you were like a big factor in the SAP community and... I know, especially in Tech at Bangalore, you were a fixture and mm-hmm. part of the mentors. Then you kind of went off the radar screen and into startup land and stuff. Yeah. What have you been up to? So um, I I was I've been doing data related systems for a while. Um, you know, er, early on with EMC, then a little bit with SAP, and then um, uh, some consulting work. And I also tried my hand at a at a product that completely just failed we were ah. t- i was trying to do um fail fast right <laughs> well it wasn't fast <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to do SAS bi in 2009 and oh you were ahead of your time yeah, that yeah, was the but, problem there <laughs> yeah but you know it was a le- good learning experience i got right. my introduction into the hadoop world back in 2009 because of that mm. um and that kind of started shaping my career into this uh, this big data area um, and that was what I've been doing. Um, that's how I was involved with SAP in different ways, uh, even before it was called big data, if you will. Um, and then around uh, 2014, um, I met up with uh, some really interesting folks um, that were doing, it was a very smart hardware team. Uh, these guys have been doing radio networks for uh, somewhere between 30 to 40 years. Wow. Um, and, you know, one of the guys on this team, um, Ed Horton, has built things that made up the earliest direct-to-home TV networks, some of the earliest cell networks, very, very experienced radio engineers. Um, and I was I was just highly impressed. Another, another guy on the team, Paul Becker, has been working on things like this for so long. And the perspectives just, you know, triggered me into this uh, this world um, and I made some good friends and we uh, we talked a lot um, and then I, j- I ended up joining their team so that's how and the name of the company is the company's called fiber f y b r okay and uh, we do um, IOT networks um, in the low power low data rate segment primarily city focused. Um, but a lot of different applications in agriculture, in industry, also have a very similar profile where you need a device that's only setting, sending a little bit of data but needs to be wireless and needs to have a very long battery life. Um, and so we're, we're focused on that part of the puzzle. So I know you guys have some customer projects going now, right? Yeah. You're turning a bit of a corner now, mm, yeah. out in the marketplace. Yes, and, and the company's old, and we're kind of the new management I'm part of that. Um, we're trying to sort of um, rebuild the business. Mm. Um, and in our recent avatar, we've basically been doing um, parking implementations, parking sensor implementations to start mm. with in cities. Uh, the most recent one is uh, downtown of Washington, D.C., uh, about 20 blocks um, outside the White House area, the Chinatown area. Um, and uh, it's been going great. Uh, there's a lot of learning from doing something like this. You know, radio in around all of those government buildings can be quite challenging. Right. Yeah. I mean, even my GPS trying to walk around in big cities can be difficult yeah. sometimes. Yeah, there's some really difficult challenges. You know, another example of an installation is Montreal, and Montreal has, over the last two winters that we've been installed there, has seen minus 27 degree Celsius oh my Lord. Uh, temperatures. And, you know, weird things happen. Batteries just cause resets, and, you know, so you learn from all of that. And, and I think I thought about moving to Canada after the election. <laughs> <laughs> Those temperatures are going to keep me yeah. in the U.S. for sure. It's very cold. So, so what, what kinds of of problems does does what you do solve for a city based on what what did they have before and what is what do you how do you help them 
Right. So I think overall, um, in different types of applications for cities, uh, we're seeing a scenario where traditionally the city, either just city or the citizens, didn't have access to information. So processes were reactive, right? You would go, you would go to a place and try to find parking. And in the process of finding parking, you'll go around in circles and waste a lot of time, fuel, create noise, create pollution, create traffic. Right. Um, but also from a city infrastructure standpoint, I think city processes are starting to be proactive. The cities want to, rather than their customers or the citizens complaining about something not working, they want to proactively detect that something's about to fail in the various services they offer to the citizens and um, and react to that, right, and solve it before it becomes a problem. Uh, flooding's one example. You, you, you want to uh, we have a device that we built that go, goes under a manhole cover, and um, it's a wireless device with a radar in it, and it's looking downwards into the man uh, into the pipe, and it can tell the level of sewage and the rate of flow of sewage in the pipe, for example, right? And so we can do predictions, we can predict blockages, we can predict that this street is going to be flooded in a little while, that kind of thing. So before you come along, basically, it's more that problems sort of slap them in the face, right? Is that, that's the issue, right? Or they might even be aware of a sewer problem until it gets serious. Until it becomes a flooding problem, they don't know it's a problem. Yeah. Right. So the idea here is, is that the communication from the devices essentially is proactive. So they don't essentially nip a lot of that in the bud from the beginning. Is correct. That- right. Uh, correct. And also there's, there are revenue opportunities for cities uh, in different ways. You know, parking, you can imagine uh, just improving the utilization of the very limited parking infrastructure we have in cities. But uh, sewage example is very interesting. Uh, we're working with a partner and uh, these guys do sewage planning for cities. And the business case is that cities pay per gallon of stuff that goes into the sewage treatment plant. And when it's raining, a lot of what ends up in the sewage treatment plant is rainwater. The storm drain systems are designed to segregate that, but they don't work very well. Uh, If you have access to information of different types, um, so this company that we're working with, um, they right now have these really expensive pieces of equipment, $15,000, $20,000 pieces that they submerge in the sewage and keep it there for a while and then they take it out and go somewhere else and take take another sample go somewhere else take another sample they collect all of this data and they try to create a model for what the city should do when rain's coming from the west right uh, however with us they would like to make this whole decision making real time so it's not a inefficient once a month, once a year updated model, but a real time thing that can reduce the amount of uh, rainwater that ends up inside um, sewage treatment plants, which is obviously wasting useful water that should Mm -hmm. end up in the drinking sources uh, and also costing cities a a lot of money, right? So these kinds of scenarios, and I can go on with several. If a city essentially relies on a one year adjustment, then then they're relying on the accuracy of that forecast, right? The so. efficiency is much lower, yeah. uh, but the real-time uh, systems you can start to do um, uh, much better efficiency. Now, you do you do the implementation for this business value case, but then you get a lot for free, right? You get the ability to uh, predict where flooding is going to happen. Now, that mm-hmm. doesn't have a monetary incentive immediately apparent, but it enables these use cases where you can predict flooding, you can predict blockages, um, because you can tell that between manhole one and manhole two, the, the, the level's dropping drastically. If a city were a business, there's a huge customer experience opportunity there to tell your residents, hey, you know, clear out or flood warning or yeah, exactly. whatever that you exactly. didn't have before. So that's huge. And there's also some interesting use cases. I was speaking uh, with a with the CTO of a company that is starting to do autonomous vehicles. And this company, they're called Best Mile. And they're based okay. in Switzerland. And they're operating about 10 buses um, in the Switzerland area. He gave me some examples that made a lot of sense of how they would use our data. And he, he, he presented two problems. One was that when an autonomous car is being routed, right, it would like to know which streets to prefer 
and which streets to avoid in the routing, right? So a street that is about to get flooded, a street that has a traffic jam on it, a street that has a gas leak on it, right. is falls in the category of streets to avoid, whereas streets that are doing better or streets you prefer because it's early in the autonomous vehicle space right now right uh, these buses that they're operating are being used as tourist vehicles and so knowing which streets have a lot of smog and can hurt the experience of the tourists that's first time experiencing this autonomous vehicle they would like to avoid uh, those streets right sure, and so yeah, we can yeah. provide that on a street by street micro level um uh, the the weather information starting with smog for example yeah yeah cool by the way listeners if you hear a little wind in the background it's because we are outside <laughs> uh hopefully the wind will die down a little but uh it's a quiet place just a little bit windy so it's the best we could do but anyhow so i wanted to ask you just from a city perspective because obviously smart cities are from a sort of hype and sort of example perspective, you see it a lot. I know IBM's got a big smart cities things going. Mm -hmm. Many other vendors do too. I like the idea. Mm -hmm. um, I like the initiative behind it. But I wonder a little bit from from a budget standpoint, mm -hmm. because one thing you see in a lot of cities is a lot of them are not fiscally very sound or they're kind of getting by. So from a smart city example, um, what are your thoughts in terms of when you approach cities, how, how do you talk about that? Because I'm sure they're asking you, like, what does this cost and blah, blah, blah. And so there are several stakeholders in a city, right? And uh, decisions require all of them to feel good about uh, a, a, a particular infrastructure change that's coming to the city. S yes. Um, where's the money going to come from to fund these initial things is a big challenge. Um, yeah. And our approach to it is... Um, is to go in with applications that either save the city money or make the city money, right? Right. Which then can be used to fund applications that don't necessarily do that, but are incredible value for uh, the customers. So just to give you an example, a parking sensor network, um, it's easy to show how the optimizations can pay back the cost of the network in, in one, two years. Uh, now, once you have a parking sensor network, you can layer other nice things on top of it. I'll give you an example. In uh, Washington, D.C., we have a parking deployment. The city has been talking to us about uh, smog sensors along with our uh, gateways so that they can recommend bicyclists which route to take today or which roads to avoid today because there's a lot of smog, especially somebody who has a, um asthmatic condition, right? right. Um, so this application, it's a nice thing to have, but there's no revenue model, right? And so right. how do you think about that? Well, you think about it in a way that you layer in the, the network because of something that either saves money or makes money, and then you layer these other applications on top. Nice. So once you have the network in, you make a financially sound decision there, and and then from there you can start thinking about civic responsibility exactly. and quality of life and, and experience, like that. right? Yeah. yeah, and experience, which is how we think about it in the for-profit world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So let me just give you my view on IoT in general, because I started out very, very skeptical about the Internet of Things, and I think a lot of it was because it it was just it was seized upon by vendors as a way to refresh some slide decks and. Mm -hmm. And what I came to understand around it is that there were two things that I, after looking at a lot of use cases that interested me, one was uniting disparate forms of, of data. Mm -hmm. So people talk a lot about big data and sometimes the data sets are big, but I think what's really interesting is combining data that has never been combined before. Right. So that was the one thing that started getting me more interested because I was like, okay, so you know, an example of like when you have retail stores that start to take into account geospatial stuff around weather forecasting and things like that that might affect real-time inventory decisions and stuff. And suddenly you're like, wow, like this external data from outside of there, did that start playing again? Stop I don't know it. why that, that shouldn't happen, but anyway, I'm going to have a fun time editing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the uh, external data sources end up being compelling. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and changing decision making inside of companies, right? So that was the one thing that started to get my attention. And then as I got further along, I started to see that there was this thing about transforming business models. Mm. 
And so your your city example is kind of interesting there too, because you say, well, instead of just solving one problem, maybe we're building a platform that opens up a whole new level of possibilities yeah. for data as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier with Tom Raftery of SAP, who's yeah. their, now their IoT evangelist. Sorry. Good luck, SAP, with that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but Tom was talking about Kaiser. He was talking about an air compressor example. Yeah. The, so and, he, and that was super interesting, yeah, right? Yeah, very interesting. So I think I, I think you're absolutely right about the two interesting aspects, right? One is that it enables combination of data and value from that combination that wasn't possible in the world before. And I'll give a very quick example of the city example. I live in Bangalore, and Bangalore, like most cities around the world, uh, streetlights are powered by a timer. Mm. And this timer is a dumb timer uh, and hard-coded into firmware that somebody wrote 10 years ago or 20 years ago, which says at 6 p.m., turn the lights on, at 6 a.m., turn it off, right? Mm. And uh, streetlight uh, energy bills are the biggest bill most cities pay every month. Right. Um, so just with a very simple combination of that trigger or that controller of a streetlight that you can automate with IoT and weather data that tells you sunrise time and sunset time or tells you when a storm is coming, it's going to be dark, right? Mm. Just that very little combination can save cities, I believe, on an average hours of on time per streetlight. And that's, a, you know, that has a huge monetary return, a return that that is only possible because of the combination, right? And you can right. do all sorts of other things with just that yeah, application. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Right? And the Kaiser example that Tom was saying, was for, this was the second part, the, the new kinds yeah. of business models, right? So a a compressor company uh, may, may go from selling compressors right. to selling air, compressed air as a service right. um, and charging their customers for the amount of air um, is very interesting. And it's interesting because it it enables several pieces of the puzzle to reduce their costs, right? So mm. a, a, a somebody who's building a machine that uses a compressor can, that manufacturer does not have a capital expen expenditure in buying a whole bunch of co compressors. They just include it and they get it for free. They pass on the as a service cost to their consumers, right? And it's, it's pretty amazing, these kinds of examples, yeah. Well, and, and the thing to build on that too is then you start to think, what you start to realize that makes, to me, interesting business models is, okay, it's it's a better probably better deal for the consumer and and et cetera. But now you're also pulling all this data yeah. from from the equipment, right? Yeah. That you weren't before. Yeah. And 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 once you gather that data, there starts to be all kinds of very interesting potentials on what you can do with that in a business capacity, right? Yeah. And of course, you have to overcome things around you know data privacy and all this other stuff. But but the point is that that the data then becomes uh, a launching pad for, for more business opportunities. And that to me is what, when I finally started to realize, hey, maybe IoT is actually somewhat interesting yeah. and relevant after all. Um, um, I, I think this is a good point to sort of maybe uh, talk a little bit about what SAP is doing. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, right? Um, uh, the, the data access opens up um, you know, things like predictive maintenance, um, yeah. better service, improved service, better utilization because you recommend your customers the right thing to do it while they're using the product, yeah. not in a stupid uh, manual that nobody reads, right? Right. Um, and um, so these kinds of uh, things are great, but it also starts to enable these new kinds of businesses to evolve around that data source uh, that isn't otherwise possible. And uh, I think some of what SAP is doing because of the Ariba history now yeah. is enabling these business networks around products that will end up going um, in this IoT space. Um, I heard about two different networks that were very interesting um, at this conference. One was the connected vehicles network, which in my space is very, very interesting because yeah. uh, we can be a source um, in that setup, um, providers of data about infrastructure 
uh, like parking, parking availability, parking pricing, et cetera, yeah. can plug into one place and one vendor, which is SAP, um, and consumers of that information, which is to start with the the car manufacturers can get a varied source uh, from that network and enable those services for their end consumers, um, which is a multiplier for everybody in the equation, I believe, right? And yeah. similarly, there was the asset intelligence network, um, right. which Tom was talking about. And that as well um, uh, opens up new kinds of service models, and it allows customers to have a full history across changing vendors and changing service vendors uh, of what the history of this product is and what's the life cycle been and how do I um, best utilize my my asset. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I refuse to talk about IoT without talking about security. <laughs> I know a lot of people don't like to do this because mm-hmm. it's, it's not a fun, sexy, exciting revenue topic, but um, especially with the headlines that hit, I mean, obviously, consumer and enterprise security have some different dimensions to it, but I think there are some commonalities in the sense that any Wi-Fi-enabled device is potentially a compromisable device, for example. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts in terms of how to think about security in IoT context? Right, so... Um I think it is wrong uh, for the industry to dismiss it, which we saw during that uh, two weeks ago, the, the, the craziness that ensued those, uh, those attacks, right? Uh, we saw a lot of people just dismiss it. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's correct. I think there, is a, there, there are some serious, difficult challenges for us to solve. I'll give you one example that that hit me for the first time. You know, I come from a software background and I was suddenly introduced to this world where I was asked to put a device that um, into the field where anybody has physical access to it, right? On a st- city street, for example. Um, and traditional security in in everything I had done before that relies on the endpoint keeping a secret, right? Mm. So a, a web service trusts you because uh, you have a, you can produce a password, and based on that password, it can figure out that it's you, right? Well, in case of devices, you put a key in it, a secret in it, and then if the device can produce that key, then you can trust that it's that device. However, a physical device sitting on a road can be tampered with, and Mm. anybody can get that one key out of that device. Uh So there are no models in our industry of how to deal with this. Um, We've done some of our work around how to make sure, you have to make sure that, yes, one device gets compromised, but you have to ensure that keys across devices are unique so that one device means the compromise of one device, not the whole right. network, which is the DDoS example. You know, the right. reason the reason the MRI botnet exists is because there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices on the internet with exactly the same secret to get into them, right? Right. Um, so uh, this is a challenge and um, it will evolve as the industry get goes from, uh, you know, toy... Raspberry Pi devices to real industrial strength things, uh, which, uh, you know, in our case, we've had a little bit of um, a, a, a lead in trying to implement, and we've learned a lot from it, right? How do you manage keys? How do you do anomaly detection and machine learning on the server side to say that a device is behaving badly? You know, a parking sensor installed on street number 10 shouldn't report from street number 30, right? Yeah. If it does, that's a problem. You know, and to do all sorts of these very basic things that, you know, the ad world has built for us the, with the categorization algorithms yeah. um, and, and get pretty far. I'm not an expert on IoT security, but what I think is that is that we, you know, we talk a lot about design thinking these days. I would say design for security, yeah. right? That's that from the get-go of your planning for whatever rollout or device you're you're thinking of churning smart design for security from the get-go right yeah and it'll break right it'll break we're aware that things will yeah, happen, yeah, right? yeah but that mindset needs to be there right right um, because to your point if you design for security then one of the things you do is make sure that each device is unique so that only 
you know, one device is compromised. And that's an example yeah. of how you would design for security. Or design for the scenario that your server is at some point going to get hacked. Well, that happens. Does that mean that this, right. this multi-million, I mean, website hacks still happen, right? But they're a problem for a week. The issue right. is with a physical network of this kind, if you lose, if you'd make a mistake and you lose secrecy, you may lose that secrecy forever. And that's yeah. a big problem, right? The WikiLeaks style or the Yahoo style thing that's yeah. affecting their their acquisition by Verizon right now. The the Mirai example, the, the DDoS botnet yeah. example is this, right? The problem is there is no way to recover from this unless yeah. you enlist the help of millions of people to fix and upgrade their devices. Right. The, the network's going to exist and keep attacking systems. Right. For anyone who's confused about that reference, a few weeks ago, there was a massive denial of service attack from multiple devices that flattened the internet, including where I was living. <laughs> Um, and and I think what was provocative about was what a great example of how in, in Internet of Things the, your weakest link is a real problem, yep. and 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 also it might not occur to you that that weak link is connected to so many certain other things, right? Yep. So you know, in this case, you know, it was connected to a massive <laughs> internet outage mm. that started with just exploiting devices that consumers either didn't weren't aware of or. A lot of times the passwords were still default, you yeah. know, and there you go. So anyway, we we got to address this, I think. We got to be able to talk about it. It's a community it. discussion, right? And I don't think we have, as an industry and as a community, solved this yet. We need to talk about it and we need to talk about it openly rather than shrugging it, shrugging it under the, the rug, right? Well, I think that's a good point because yeah. I was at IoT event this summer and one of the big criticisms of that event was none of the keynotes even touched on it and it just felt like, look, it's got to be a theme. Like, we don't want to cater to fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but we should be able to have this dialogue too. Yep. So, okay. So, I'm going to stop there on this recording, but I would like to talk with you for a few more minutes about SAP. So, we're going to take a quick break. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.